All right, I'm Curtis Talley. Um, this is our MSU affirmative action statement. I was mentioning uh, earlier, this is actually the third time that I've spoken down here in Allegan County. Uh, the first time was December 17, 2012, and it was on a lot of the same, uh, well, some of the same topics we're going to talk about tonight. Mark gave me quite a list <laughs> of topics to talk about tonight. So, for example, with oil and gas leasing, that's going to be a very uh, uh, a brief discussion of the lease. And normally, I spend 45 minutes on the oil and gas lease. So, to get all the topics in, it's going to be uh, a brief uh brief on the lease, but when I say, say the standard lease, every company has what they call as a standard lease, every, and all the company's standard leases are very similar, but they all differ a little bit. But most of the things I talk about, the standard leases always have them in them because it's always for the company. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And uh, you know, with this small group, anytime you have a question, you know, throughout the, my presentation, feel free to interrupt me and uh, ask any questions you want. So, you know, with our educational effort, we want uh, landowners to learn, you know, the oil and gas uh, business has been around, you know, for about 150 years, so it's not anything new. Uh, it, you know, it takes place all around the country, all around the world, so landowners uh, where this has been involved with for many years, have learned some lessons. So uh, we want you to learn those lessons, learn your options, so that when you are, if you're presented with one of these topics, you know you can make an informed decision about what uh, what you want to do because you do have options on a lot of the things I'm going to talk about. Um, but I do want to say that what the industry is doing is working. And they're, they're doing a heck of a good job of promoting, or of uh, producing our energy. And you notice up here, it says uh, shale plains. Well, all of these areas of the country, they've known for many years, had hydrocarbons in the rocks. But they didn't have the ava availability to draw those hydrocarbons out because they were so tightly held in the rock. And they were shales. Uh, the most uh, common one right now is the Marcellus Shale in Pennsylvania, but the Antrim Shale up in Crawford County, Antrim County, you know, that's been produced in Michigan, gosh, probably since the 70s. So, uh, you know, there's been oil and gas production in Michigan for many years, and you just haven't heard a lot about it down here, I don't think. Although I think there's some fields not too far from here, isn't there? Yeah, is there, is up around okay. Hopkins and okay, so yeah, it's been all around. Uh, but the new, the new uh, big boys are uh, the Barnett Shale, the Eagle Ford, and the Bakken and the Marcellus. Uh, somewhat down here in Southeast Michigan now, um, Oakland County, Lapeer County, um, Macomb County, or Macomb County. I'm sorry. Uh, some, you know, there's been leasing going off and on the past few years in this area. So, uh, Southeast Michigan right now is still very hot. We did a, a meeting in Ar Ann Arbor last month and we had over 300 people at that meeting uh, because they're, they're wanting to drill oil and gas wells near Ann Arbor. So it's happening a lot of places. I'm going to mention the Barnett more later because it actually is in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. So you've got a lot of oil and gas drilling and, and, and city operations, uh, residences uh, going on at the same time. The Bakken is primarily a crude oil formation. Uh, it started producing, they started producing it in two, about 2000. What made it producible was hydraulic fracturing. And now the Bakken is the second leading state in petroleum production next to Texas. It passed Alaska uh, two years ago. So it came from nothing to uh, really producing a lot of uh, crude oil. So we're going to start off talking about the lease. Are any of you guys farmers? Okay, you guys are farmers. Hobby. You're not? Hobby farmer. Okay. 
Well, if you if you have anything to sell, do you ever have some kind of a plan to sell it? Or at harvest, do you say, oh my gosh, I got all this crop. I better take it to town and sell it. I mean, do you have a plan for your marketing? Well, the lease is the marketing plan for your mineral rights. A lot of people don't look at them that way. It is amazing how many people are offered $10 an acre by a landman. They've never been offered that before, and they'll sign a lease without even looking at it. You know, give me some people, you give me 10 bucks an acre, and then I'll take it. And they're treating their minerals as second-class citizens. They may be treating their resources as second-class, and they may be treating, if water quality is a concern, they may be um, missing some things there. And that's what we try to bring out to people, is what your options are. You know, and mineral income can be substantial. If you're in the right place, your mineral income can far exceed your surface income, if you have, particularly if you have uh, crude oil. So even in, but even with a good lease, if they do come out to drill on your property, you still need to manage that lease. You need to make sure that, that because the companies that actually do the work are subcontractors. They're not really the company you leased with. They hire other people. So those other people not, may not be aware of what's in that lease, and you need to be making sure that everybody is following what you guys agreed to. Now this is busy, and it's going to be the only busy picture I've got, but this is the first paragraph of the oil and gas lease, and it's called the granting clause. It doesn't say that in the lease, but that's what it is. And of course, it's, uh, it's drafted by oil and gas attorneys. It's not really made for the layman to understand, and that's where we try to come in to help people understand it. But unless you know the lingo, Bill, there's, um, there's language that looks innocent, but on the ground, it can be, uh, it can, uh, it can, can provide you some surprises. You know, for example, you're granting, the landowner is granting these things to the company. You know, all rights, privileges, and easements, useful or convenient. So that means they can go anywhere they want, anytime they want, as long as it's convenient for them. Well, landowners have learned they can ratchet this back and they can, act, they can require in the lease that before any activities occur, you two are going to sit down together and decide, okay, where is the access road going to be? You know, where is where's the drilling site going to be? Uh, you know, how far away from houses are, are you going to be? You know, in the lease, it's, it uh, says they can be 200 feet from a house. Well, yeah, it can easily be changed if you know you can ask to change that and make it a lot further away. So, uh, you know, you can ratchet that back. Storing sounds very innocent because they have to store oil in tanks. But Michigan stores more underground gas than any other state in the country. They use old oil and gas wells. They use uh, geologic formations underground that are uh, very perforated and there's nothing in them right now except perforated rock. But if you grant storing in the lease, your property can be used for gas storage with no additional money paid to you. Well, if you know you don't want to allow gas storage for free, if they ever want to use your property for gas storage, you can charge extra for that. Uh, from any land, uh, from said land or land adjacent there too, that means they can cross your land to go adjacent to do work on other people's property. Now you may not be getting any royalties from that because you may not be in the drilling unit, but you're granting them to do that for free. Well, you can change that to say that you can only cross your land for free if it's a well that you're getting royalties from. Uh, disposal of uh, utilized wells, facilities for disposition of water, brine, or other fluids. This means, for free, they can put an injection well on your property. Well, putting a well to put stuff down the hole is not producing oil and gas. So even if you want to consider an injection well, you can say these types of facilities are only upon owner's written permission. You know, some people don't want 
things dispose of on their property. They've got to dispose it somewhere else. Well, these are options you can have. Uh, power communication lines, power stations, you know, those are all surface activities. Those are not drilling an oil and gas well. If you allow those for free in the granting clause, you can never charge for when they put uh, like a compressor station on your property or something that uses your surface. So those are things that landowners have learned over the years to really watch for. But the landowner that owns mineral rights, he's got a really tough job. And I call it the conundrum because you are blessed to have those mineral rights and the landman comes and he's offering you a check to sign the lease. Cash money, you may have never had an opportunity to lease before and all at once somebody's going to offer you a uh, you know, $5,000 check. That's, that's very tempting, uh, hard to turn down. But if you are concerned about your surface uh, reclamation, how the surface is going to be treated during drilling, how much money you can make, the lease is where this is done. That's where you can make your money and protect your resources. And as I mentioned, you know, the companies won't deny this, and it's like any contract, any business contract, it's written by the person that wrote it for that person. Have any of you gotten a house mortgage? Anybody you bought a house and had a loan? How thick were the papers you signed? <laughs> How many of those papers do you think protected you? <laughs> They're protecting themselves. The person that wrote the contract is protecting them. And it's the same thing with oil and gas. So it can be a win-win, but you have to do it by negotiating. You have to uh, say, I'm not going to accept this. Um, we got to make a change. When you negotiate, you're not going to get all you want. So you have to decide what you're willing to accept. And the company may come and tell you, you know what, this is take it or leave it. You either take my offer or leave it. And that's really hard because he's saying, here's the check, sign this lease, take it or leave it. Uh, and that's what you have to decide, uh, you know, to, to, to decide. Um, but it's not uncommon to say no until your goals are met. Like I said, this is the third time I've talked in, talked in Allegan County. Uh, so they come, they see, they, they, they pick the low-hanging fruit, they find the people that just want to sign for any kind of money. If they drill some wells, get some success, they come back, go back to people that said no, maybe offer them a better deal. You know, you just never know. Um, but, you know, standard leases are changing. There was a, a lease in Ionia County recently where the first offer from the company, they offered 23 changes to that standard lease and what's called a lease addendum to make it more uh, compatible with the landowner. So uh, the companies are getting a little better. There's three types of leases. The old lease, standard lease, uh, you got paid a bonus and then they paid you a certain dollars per acre every year until or if they drill the well. The state of Michigan still gets that lease. Private people are offered a paid up lease. Now what that means is you don't get that yearly payment per acre. Any cash you get until they drill a well is in that bonus payment. That's why they say it's paid up. They're paying it all in advance. Uh, so if you sign a bonus for a five year lease for uh, you know, $50 an acre, that's actually $10 an acre for five years. They're just paying it all in advance. And then the non-development lease. The state of Michigan uses lots of non-development leases when they uh, put leases out to bid uh, for their environmentally sensitive areas. So, you know, non-development leases are not anything new to the oil and gas industry. Um, if they would guarantee no surface disturbance or any structures, uh, which includes pipelines, you got to make sure that's in the uh, agreement, but with the horizontal drilling and directional drilling, they can go on one site and do everything underground, under your property, and they don't need um, to have facilities on your property. You know, there's going to be impacts. You wouldn't sign an oil and gas lease if you didn't expect there's going to be some impacts. 
This is a uh, this is a, a well in Pennsylvania that's being hydraulically fractured. So the drilling rig, the big drilling rig's already come and gone. So now they're developing the well uh, with the hydraulic fracturing. Uh, it's a 24 hour a day procedure. You can see it, you know, in all kinds of weather. You know, like I said, where did the road come from? Uh, how wide is the road gonna be? How big is the pad gonna be? How are you gonna reclaim it? All these things can be talked about in your lease negotiations. And if you do it right, you, after the well is drilled, the footprint can be very small. You know, here's a, a site that, uh, there's the oil well, and see how small an area, it's not the same site, of course, I just showed, but if you do things right, you know, you can keep cropping pretty darn close to the well, uh, you know, after they've come, come and gone. So I mentioned, you know, the, uh, the income can be pretty substantial. Uh, this is what I call magnitude of the royalty, and it's the ideal situation using gross income. The lease you're offered pays you on net income. And how many think you calculate the net or the company calculates the net? <laughs> the company takes all the revenue, they calculate your costs, what they're called post-production costs, and then they deduct that from your royalty. And oil and gas attorneys and uh, research we've done, that will reduce your royalty by 50 to 90% per year, those deductions. So that's why I'm using gross income because you can negotiate that. So if you own 40 acres and they hit an oil well at 25 barrels a day, it produces 200 days and you sell it, they sell it for $90 a barrel, that well is going to gross $450,000 a year. In that first year, if you get a one-eighth cost-free, that's $1,400 an acre. And just by negotiating the royalty, if you don't if you do anything but negotiate the royalty, look how much your income potential goes up. Uh, just by doing that. Now, the big, the, the, the uh, most common question I get is the land man says, if I don't lease, they can force me to, to lease anyway. You know, everybody, everybody around me is already leased and they're gonna force me to lease and not only that, I'm gonna have to pay all kinds of penalties before I get a royalty. Well, that's not correct. Um, that's why I talk about compulsory pooling, and actually in the new oil and gas regulations, they're calling it statutory pooling now, because it's, it's written into state law, uh, the pooling. So what the nice thing about it is, it deals with only one well, it's not all of your land. So if you own 40 acres, and they only need 20 acres to get enough acreage for a drilling permit, they're only going to use 20 acres of your property, not all 40, like if you leased it. So it's not a lease, it's an order by the supervisor of wells. You don't get the lease bonus, but your royalty begins like anybody else's royalty as soon as they start uh, selling oil and gas, and you get a one-eighth royalty based on gross income. Because in Michigan, it's against the law to deduct all those costs I talked about unless you agree to it in the lease. Most landowners don't know that, so they always put it in the lease that they're going to deduct it. And it's a non-development. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you're compulsory or statutory pooled, you know, you're getting a, you only get an eighth, but it's cost-free, it's non-development, there's no facilities. Um, and no lease, it's just the acres they need for that one well. So for many landowners, if they can't negotiate a better lease, this is a very good way to go. So, and the other seven eights, I don't want to go into it in too detailed because I've got a lot of information on that, but what the other seven eights does, that's, uh, out of that seven eights, you actually are, are treated like an investor in the well and you end up owning your proportionate share of the well in addition to your royalty. So, uh, you know, you can end up getting your royalty plus a percent of the well income if it's a good well down the road. So, if the land bank tells you they're going to make you uh, participate, you know, signing that 
lease, if you don't want to, is not a reason to sign it. You do have an option. Okay, uh, Mark wanted me to talk about protecting groundwater quality. And uh, the American Petroleum Institute has best practices for water quality protection. Now, what's your first reaction when you see that the Petroleum Institute has these practices? Do you think they're going to be good or, or not so good? Well, actually, they're very good. Uh, now, I wrote a news article about it that goes much more into detail. It's, uh, it's document APIHF1. There's no water protection offered in the standard lease. So if you want to protect your water, you need to add it into the lease. Uh, and what the API recommends is you test your water before any activities start so you get a baseline quality. You, you want to know what the water quality was before any development occurred for oil and gas. And then you test it in six months after it's hydraulically fractured to see if there's been any change. And this is not a test for drinking water. This is a, a special test because what you're doing is you want to test for things that the companies may be using for hydraulic fracturing. So you're going to be testing for benzene, toluene, uh, petroleum hydrocarbons, which is methane, uh, and total dissolved solids. Uh, that's something that is, that is also tested for in a water well. And the list of chemicals that the company has on site that they're using for fracturing you can also use. But to keep the cost down, if you just test it for dissolved solids and methane, and you didn't find anything, you'd probably be fairly safe. But you must use the proper procedures and a qualified laboratory. If you try to do this yourself, you know, a good oil and gas attorney down the road, if there are water quality problems, they're going to accuse you of tainting the supply, tainting the sample, or uh, so you got to do it right so you know it's going to stand up if there is any problem. Would you go to the trouble of maintaining a chain of custody, having a third party pull you the sample, it. any of that kind of absolutely, paranoia? Absolutely, absolutely. You want a third party to do it all. Absolutely. You want a third party to do everything. Uh, and here's an example of what you can do in the oil and gas lease to help protect your water. And this is right out of a lease that's in Michigan. You know, if the water tests reflect a change, and water lessers quality or quantity, then it's presumed that the lessee caused it. And the lessee's going to be required to furnish a suitable water supply until it's remediated. Companies will agree to that in the lease, if you know to ask for it. And there are also companies now, particularly in Southeast Michigan, that have put in the lease, they will guarantee you they will be, there will be no hydraulic fracturing. Uh, Jackson County, Oakland County, Washtenaw counties, uh, some of the companies, because of the geology, they don't need a hydraulic refractor. They, they'd still want the horizontal drilling, though, I'm, I'm betting. Yeah, that's a very good point, and, and that, we can get into that right now. Let me ask you a question. What percentage of horizontal wells drilled are hydraulically fractured? 25%, 75%, 100%, or it depends? Well, it goes back to what you just said. It depends. Hmm. You know, and there's, there's so much uh, missing, so many misconceptions. Everybody thinks a horizontal well is also hydraulically fractured, and that's not true. It depends on the geology that they're exploring. And for example, I don't know if you've heard of the Trenton Black River Formation. Uh, that is a, uh, basically a limestone, and it already has the natural fractures in it, so they don't need to... Uh, to hydraulic fracturing. Yes, ma'am. So, what about the uh, acid uh, uh, drilling that they're talking about? Uh, they did a couple wells in Barry County, was that? Well, the acid, and there's some acid used in hydraulic fracturing too, and I'll show you a list of ingredients here in a minute. The reason why they're using acid in, uh, in some of these wells is what happens when acid uh, reacts with calcium. Makes CO2. And if, what does it do to the calcium? Kind of eats it? 
-hmm. Okay, the Trenton Black River is a calcium formation. So to help improve the, the, the permeability and the fracturing, they'll actually treat that well with a, a solution that has acid in it uh, to help dissolve some of that calcium. And it may be a, a vertical well. You know, it doesn't have to be a horizontal well. That's, that's been around for many years, that type of, uh, that's called developing the well. But they're still, they're still pumping chemicals or whatever. Yeah, they're still. The ground, just kind of like they would, uh, uh, in a sense, like a fractured well. Not nearly as many. But not nearly as many. Yeah, not nearly as many because it's a vertical well. And, you know, if you picture your water well, your water well is a vertical well. You know, and you've got a very small part of the tube exposed to the aquifer. Well, with a horizontal well, what they do is when they hit the zone they want to produce, they turn that and they put all the horizontal leg in the zone they want to produce. So that's why uh, you have so many more um, materials sent down the hole because a horizontal well can replace 15 to 20 vertical wells. So that's why it's horizontal drilling, in my opinion, is very uh, surface friendly because uh, you have a lot fewer vertical wells. Um, let's see, possible to negotiate the company pay for the test. The new, and I'll get into this a little bit more, the new uh, oil and gas regulations are now saying that the, the uh, baseline test for uh, horizontal, or excuse me, hydraulic fracturing is to be paid for by the company. So that's a, that's a new thing coming. And then as an as a owner, you're not environmentally liable if you sign an oil and gas lease. That's state law. So we talked about horizontal wells. There's one right there. Uh, now, and as I mentioned, this is a, uh, you know, the Collingwood Shale is up in uh, Kalkaska, Misaki County. So they drill straight down and then they can turn the drill bit and they can keep that drill bit right in the entire zone they want to harvest. So that's why horizontal drilling is so effective. Much more of the well is exposed to the area they want to uh, harvest. And this is a picture of the Collingwood Shale. Uh, you know, Colling uh, shales are very, very tight. They, they have the hydrocarbons in them, but they have no permeability or porosity to release those hydrocarbons. And that's why the horizontal, or excuse me, the hydraulic fracturing creates those cracks. Okay, here's one of the uh, new rules that uh, was on the list tonight. It's the, uh, the, the DEQ proposed hydraulic fracturing rules. It's still in draft form. Uh, it requires use of the water withdrawal assessment tool. Uh, how many of you, uh, is anybody here uh, got a, a farmer that irrigates? Well, any farmer that irrigates, if it's a new well, he has to use this, this statewide water, water assessment tool to check to see if his new well is going to affect existing wells. And if it's going to affect an existing well, well he may not get the permit to drill that well. <coughs> so the state the oil and gas industry has to also use that as an assessment tool to make sure if they want to drill a fresh water well at the drilling site that it's not going to impact any existing wells. So they've got to use that and they've had to use that since 2011 uh, in a director's order. This is going to be law. They're going to be required to sample all water wells up to 10 within a quarter mile of where they want their oil and gas well. So if they're in an area that has quite a bit of residential development and there's quite a few residential wells, they're going to have to sample up to 10 of those wells to, to check water quality before they start drilling. And then the, the oil and gas company is going to have to pay for those tests. They've got to use a lab approved by the DEQ. And then these are the, some of the same, uh, same, uh, compounds that I mentioned earlier the Petroleum Institute recommended they test for and then they also have to monitor their uh, well pressures during fracking because if the pressure goes down that means what does that mean? 
if they're putting a lot of pressure in and it starts going down a lot, what's that going to mean? Something broke loose. They got a leak. They got a leak. So they have to monitor those and report them to the state. And I'm just going through some of the highlights of this legislation. So as I mentioned, each horizontal well can replace 10 to 20 vertical wells. Hydraulic fracturing is the completing of the well to stimulate the oil and gas. It, uh, and some horizontal and directional wells are fractured and, and some are not, as we've talked about. So to go on with those hydraulic fracturing rules, if you're a water well owner, the company has to uh, give you the results of the water test within, uh, within 45 days. Michigan is a little different than other states in that any fluids that come back out of the well after it's hydraulically fractured has to go into steel tanks. It cannot go into uh, earthen pits that have been dug. And we'll talk a little bit more of that here in a minute. Uh, what I'm a, a little concerned about is that the DEQ rules are silent on the post-testing to double check that the quality of the water is still at baseline after the drilling. So the API actually says we should test again six months later. The DEQ is saying, well, just the baseline test is good enough. Uh, we okay. still, and we're still within the comment period, I believe, on this, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, we sure are. People could point that up to the DEQ. Yeah. Okay, remember at the beginning, I mentioned the uh, Barnett Shale in Texas. Okay, the Ar city of Arlington, Texas is probably the most drilled city in the United States right now. And these are all horizontal wells. And there, there's the pad. You have all these wells being drilled from one site. All these are, uh, are drilled. Uh, now, all these are hydraulically fractured because the barnet is a shale. But that's what uh, the horizontal drilling can do. And all of these, when I first started looking into oil and gas production here in Michigan, it's really strange, but I, went, I was told that Tarrant County, Texas had lots of development going on. So I went to their... Uh, online uh, the click and recorder site and I was looking at recorded oil and gas leases and uh, Tarrant County is Arlington <laughs> so I looked at these uh, probably four or five years ago and it turns out this is uh, Tarrant County uh, but you know everyone and I looked at leases that were for a quarter of an acre because they are leasing every house, house by house, and paying those people their proportionate share of the royalty because they're in that type of area. And you gotta pay the landowner their, for their minerals. Is that a single vertical borehole that they've got all those connected to, or? They're, they're multiple boreholes, okay. but they're all on the same pad. So the pad can be pretty big. Uh, I've got one picture, I showed it some <coughs> other, uh, presentations that there's a pad in uh, Greeley, Colorado that has 33 wells on the same pad. Wow. So, uh, but, you know. So everyone that goes underneath everybody's house, they're getting a the lease. That's correct. Okay. That's exactly right. And they're, they're starting from right there, and they're just uh, they're spreading, spacing them out, and uh, that's what's happening down there. So now let's get into disclosure of the hydraulic fracture chemical additives. Um, it's part of the new regulations that uh, you mentioned that are still in the comment stage. The company must submit all the chemical additives to fractfocus.org. Now fractfocus is the nationwide uh, reporting registry for all of the wells across the country that use hydraulic fracturing. Uh, and it's run by the Groundwater Protection Council and the Interstate Oil and Gas Combat Commission. And here in a minute, I'll show you a well from Michigan that's on the registry. But the company, the company is required to list all of the additives that they're using in the hydraulic fracturing, uh, which can be the acids, uh, biocides, corrosion inhibitors, gels. They have to list the trade name, and I'll show you one here in a minute, and who they bought the chemical from. 
They have to list the specific identity of each chemical additive. Uh, but in all states I've checked, if there are trade secret chemicals, those can be withheld from the public, but they have to be reported to, uh, like, the supervisor of Wells. Um, and it, it, give me an example of a trade secret. How many here know the formula for Coca-Cola? <laughs> <laughs> no, does, no, does anybody know the formula for Coca-Cola? Should my dad's business manager for Coca-Cola just drink? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a trade secret, and, and the, the oil and gas industry, all, all industries may have some trade secrets, and the, the industry is willing to disclose the chemical family, but they don't want to disclose the formula of how they use it to the public. Um, so an example would be a hydrocarbon or an acid or a base, those would be chemical families, or is it... Yeah, more? or a gas. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. So... Uh, to help with that disclosure, every chemical known to mankind has what's called a CAS number. Uh, it's a unique number that identifies only that chemical. So the companies do have to disclose that number. Um, and it gives a lot of information about that substance, like, uh, you know, what its boiling point, its uh, melting point, you know. Lots of its physical characteristics. And the thing about it is, the same number is used worldwide. And the companies are going to have to state the maximum concentration of each chemical they have in their uh, fracturing fluid. And I'll show you here an example. Okay, so here is a, here's a well in Canada. It's the, primarily, the primary company drilling in the Collingwood Shale up in Kalkaska and Masaki County, and they're using hydraulic fracturing. So this is off the uh, frac focus, this information. So in that hydraulic fracturing fluid, they have 90% water, silica quartz, silica quartz, and silica quartz are what? Sand. Sand. This is one size, this is another size, and this is another size. So they're separating them out. And then there's a little bit of hydrochloric acid, uh, ethanol. Anybody here use non-ionic surfactants? Yeah, dish soap. Dish soap, you spray herbicides. Mm -hmm. Usually you put a, a non-ionic non surfactant in your herbicide mix. Uh, so, you know, in this case, you know, about 90, what, 95, 98, uh, you know, over 98% of that material that was put down the well was the water and the different sands. And do you know why they use the sand? Hold the gaps open once they break it? Yeah, those, those like I mentioned, those, those uh, shales are so tight that if they don't, once they pressure, bring the pressure up to cause the cracks, if they don't use the sand, those cracks will close again when they let the pressure off. So they, they have the sand in there to go in the crack and keep the crack open uh, after they are done fracturing, so then the uh, material will flow. So here's the uh, registry of this well in frac focus. Uh, here it was in May 30th in Kalkaska County. There's the well number in Canada. There's the well name, uh, uh, longitude, latitude, um, uh, total uh, water used was uh, 12 million gallons because this, this well went, uh, I believe this well went two miles horizontally. Uh, but here's, uh, you know, here's the water and the percent. There's that silica quartz and the percent. So every, every uh, material, it has the trade name, who they bought it from, what its purpose was, what the ingredient is, and the percent in the uh, horizontal uh, fluid. So it just repeats basically what I had on that slide. And then here's the uh, next part of it. So everybody has a pretty good idea of uh, you know what the material.
materials in there are what they're used for. So uh, frack focus, the whole idea of it is anybody anywhere in the country can go check on a well that's been hydraulically fractured and they can get this information. And here's a map of the wells that have been hydraulically fractured in Michigan. Uh, there's 10 that, been, uh, that are producing and they are these, uh, these uh, purple and some of them are hid. Uh, and those are the Encana wells. There's 29 applications that are pending for hydraulically fracturing. Five wells have been drilled and they had uh, poor results, so they've already plugged them. And 10 wells have been drilled that aren't fractured yet. And the nearest one that they've hydraulically fractured is here in uh, Ionia County. Well, actually, it hasn't been fractured yet, it's just been uh, drilled. So you don't have really. Uh, there's Allegan County, so you don't really have anything close by yet. And you may not if there's the Trenton Black River or one of those other calcium formations. So how does Michigan compare with other states? Well, if you follow this very closely, you know Pennsylvania had problems. Uh, and Pennsylvania, you know, just was not ready for the boom that happened when the Marcellus Shale took off. But Pennsylvania also has some unique problems. You know, Pennsylvania is coal country. So, you know, they, they, uh, they may sink an oil and gas well and find an old coal, coal shaft, which, you know, is just a big open uh, cavity. Well, you're not expecting that when you're drilling into, into rock. So that caused some problems. Um, but what Michigan, or excuse me, what Pennsylvania did was they allowed the hydraulically fractured, the fracturing fluid that came back up the wells, they allowed them to take that to sewage treatment plants. And the treatment plants are not designed to treat those kinds of materials. And so when the water left the treatment plant, it uh, had some contaminants that contaminated the, uh, the rivers. They also allowed the flow back water to go in earthen pits. So they would dig a pit, and that's great, but if you have all at once a huge, uh, say, rainstorm, and the, the dam on the pit breaks, then you've got water spilling out, and where does water go? Uphill or downhill? <laughs> Went downhill into the water, and they, so they had some problems with that. You know, Michigan does not allow the earth in pits. All the flow back water has to go in the tank. What's the potential for hitting old oil wells? I, act, I have a well logic account, which uh -huh. has records of all the wells basically going back to the 30s. And there's a ton of old oil wells from the 20s and 30s. Uh -huh. You know, do they ever hit those things? Well, all of those wells are supposed to be registered with the state. And, uh, you, know, like, you know, the key words are supposed to be. Right. I, you know, the, the odds of that, though, I think are really small. Okay. They, they know where most of them are. Would the old existing wells be way shallower than where they're going now? They could be way shallower, and actually they, they didn't have the technology to, to plug them uh, like they did, uh, like they do now. I mean, I've heard, heard stories that to plug those old wells, they just fill them up with timbers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they just did not have the technology uh, and the knowledge we do now. You know, now to plug the well, you got to cement it to the bottom, and uh, uh, it's very, very unlikely that they would find those. So I mentioned the frac focus. Uh, Colorado, their hydraulic fracturing uh, regulations are almost identical to Michigan's. They also allow protections for trade secrets, uh, the same as uh, Michigan does. So here's an example that's going on here in Michigan. This is over in uh, uh, Livonia, and I got this slide, uh, you know, we've done a number of educational meetings over in Southeast Michigan. Many times we invite the oil and gas industry to also give their presentation and explain what they're doing. So West Bay Exploration is a uh, Michigan-based company. They're using horizontal drilling over there, but they're not using hydraulic fracturing. In fact, they're one of the companies that will guarantee they will not use hydraulic fracturing over there. So what they did is they made an 
arrangement, made an agreement with the uh, Schoolcraft Community College that over there in an unused area they were going to put the drilling site. And then they drilled directionally underground down here to this point, and then they turned it and went vertical another 3,500 feet to uh, start producing oil and gas. So all these people, whoever is in that drilling unit, either, uh, well, in that case, they said they got everybody leased. So, uh, and you've been in Michigan, you've got these homeowners under an oil and gas lease. <clears throat> Now, I have a little bit of information on injection wells. Uh, you know, I talked about them earlier. An injection well is a well that's used to dispose of material back underground. Uh, how many people get a warm and fuzzy feeling when you talk about injection well? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't either. It, it's always kind of troubled me. Um, but a lot of what they are putting back underground is what was there to begin with. Um, you know, hydrocarbons are not clean, uh, but it also has some other things added to it, you know, in the hydraulic fracturing fluid, but, you know, they're, uh, they're very common, they're used nationwide, uh, and they're used to inject water, gas, brine, or CO2, and CO2 is where we're going to get into the pipe line regulation. So it's, uh, they're used for increasing, you know, recovery of hydrocarbons and uh, they can be used to store natural gas in an injection well. And uh, the hydraulic fracturing flowback fluid, you know, contains natural salt water that's down in the well. The materials dissolve during fracking. The fracking fluid, uh, you know, those are, can be injected underground in, in special wells that are regulated jointly by the EPA and the DEQ. So both entities have to sign off on the permit. What's the potential in Michigan for liberating uh, radioactive stuff underground and bring it back up? Well, that's a really good question. And there's a lot of areas in Michigan where there is natural radioactivity. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I don't know if there's natural radioactivity in Michigan or not. That is one problem they, they're having in North Dakota. You know, some of the, uh, there is natural radioactivity down in the Bakken, and of course when they fracture it and some of that material comes back up, it's slightly radioactive. Uh, so that is adding a, a new twist. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, now we're getting into the pipeline legislation, and this is where it might affect uh, planning commissions. <coughs> This is kind of complicated. Um, it involved these four different acts. And for it to go into effect, all of these acts had to all be approved this year. And what it did was it amended the uh, 1929 Crude Oil and Petroleum Act, which uh, uh, by adding powers to the Michigan Public Utilities Commission, giving them authority over pipelines carrying CO2 for what's called secondary recovery. Um, and so there's some give and take here. Uh, how many of you have heard we have too much carbon in our atmosphere? <laughs> We've all heard that, okay? Secondary recovery means they, are, they can pump CO2 gas down a hole over here under high pressure, and it'll cause more flow, depending on the right geology, it'll cause more flow to move over here where there's a well that they want to take up the oil and gas. That's what secondary recovery, they're, they're, they've already produced quite a bit of oil and gas and they're trying to figure out a way to get more out of that well. So, you know, there is technology to put CO2 back down oil and gas wells to, uh, to what's called sequestered carbon. Um, and both, uh, both, all these acts, you know, passed overwhelmingly by both the House and Senate. It doesn't appear at all that they were controversial uh, you know, when, it, when they were passed in April of this year. There's two things that uh, I think landowners really need to watch is the, the, the acts use both the term right-of-way and easement. And those can be totally different. 
a right-of-way has an expiration date. You know, like out west, many right-of-ways don't last longer than 30 years. An easement, whoops, an easement can go on forever and run with the land. So you have to be really careful. They use both terms in, in this act. So uh, landowners are going to have to be very careful because if uh, somebody comes out to them and says, hey, uh, we're going to run a pipeline across you, and here's the act that says we have the right of eminent domain to take an easement, without knowing this, people are going to believe them. But you really got to watch this, I think. Landowners are going to have to really be aware of that because a right of way is the right to use or travel over someone else's land and that owner still has uh, uh, the right to continue using that land. So for a pipeline, you can put a pipeline underground and after the pipeline is in, you can you know, go back to using it the way you want it because the pipeline is not affecting the surface. But an easement, uh, runs with the land permanently. In fact, uh, like uh, Consumers Energy, when they want a new uh, power line route, they get easements because it's for the public good and they want them to be permanent. But with these pipelines, uh, I don't think it has to be permanent. So in this legislation, what they did to give the oil and gas companies some incentive is they reduced the severance tax from 5% for gas and 6.6% for oil to 4% for each. But it only applies to these wells where they're going to be using carbon dioxide uh, to help uh, sequester the carbon and increase the uh, flow. And it does allow companies to condemn private property if it involves a public interest, uh, not a private interest. And it, it, uh, stays very clearly in there, uh, you know, this is not for companies that have private pipeline projects. This is only for uh, projects for the public good. And it says, right, you can be by eminent domain to acquire rights of way. So it says that, but also, you know, like I said, it uses the language easement, which is very confusing. But let's say you're a landowner, and they want to put a CO2 pipeline across your property, or, yeah, across your property. They are required in these acts, the surveyor has to notify you they want to survey your land for a pipeline. They also have to tell you in writing what the impacts to your property physically are pr predicted to be. That uh, in writing they will tell you if you have drain tile, they're going to repair or replace it. They're going to segregate topsoil from subsoil. And we always say this with oil and gas drilling, always require them to segregate the topsoil from the subsoil. So when they reclaim the, the site and put the topsoil back where it was. So this act requires them to segregate topsoil from subsoil. They have to appraise your property and tell you what method they're going to use. The, the landowner can use historic yields to uh, establish the loss of value if you're going to lose some cropland. They have to pay for all damages. They do. And uh, they do have the right to keep trees and that type of thing out of the right of way, you know, with no additional payment to you. So that, in my opinion, that's pretty good. You know, that's required in the act for all landowners. And then one of the acts, that's the Act 83 actually authorizes the use of public highways and condemnation of private property for pipelines transporting CO2. Uh, in Act 85 it says the private operators are not subject to this act if it's only for private business and not public interest. For a lot of like a gathering line, for example. So it has to be a pipeline that's going to be used to benefit the public. Now, I don't know how they determine that for sure, but that's what the language says. And then to be granted the right to install the pipeline, they have to also submit a detailed uh, map of the route, the size, capacity of the line, and then any other lines already uh, near the 
we're not that one today. And that is what I have for you. Um, you know, we've got a, uh, lots of resources for people. This is our oil and gas web page. Um, I have an article or a fact sheet I wrote that talks a lot about the, what you need to know for rights of way. Uh, some of that I mentioned to you tonight. Um, and it, you know, the state of Michigan oil and, oil and gas lease has many of the things that we tell landowners they should have in theirs. Um, I talk, I have a good fact sheet about compulsory pooling and using an example well. Uh, you know, lots of news articles I've written. So, uh, and I didn't have time to talk tonight, but also I uh, just want to mention we did a, uh, there are parts of Michigan landowners are being contacted to sell their non producing mineral rights and not lease them. In fact, we did a, a meeting in Santa Lac County in January because so many people are getting contacted by out-of-state people wanting to buy their non-producing mineral rights, which is pretty amazing. Uh, but there are many, many things you got to think about short-term and long-term if you want to sell your, your mineral rights, and uh, I wrote about that in that article. Oh, I thought that was hid. Um, and that, I'll just tell you, I didn't realize that was on here, but this is an example of how not to segregate topsoil from subsoil. See, look, this is a well. Of course, you have to have a, 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 a flat area, but look how they've had to cut into the subsoil to make this well site, and where is your pile of topsoil? It's all mixed in with this subsoil. So you know that picture I showed near the beginning where they had all the un nice uniform crop around that well? This well they ain't going to have. Because when they go back to reclaim this, they're going to put all that subsoil back on there and you're going to be able to see where that well site was for generations. And that's it. A lot of information. It's Mark's fault. He told me this is what I <laughs> Guilty. Yes, ma'am. Gathering information on uh, the percentage of wells to have a hydraulic fracturing or the injection wells, percentage of wells which actually leak. Is anybody gathering data about it? Okay, that one slide had the, uh, the wells in Michigan that have been hydraulically fractured so far. Mm -hmm. See, there have been 10 that have been hydraulically fractured that are producing, and uh, there has not been any leaks. Incidence of contamination of water contamination of contamination in Michigan. Uh, the DEQ will tell you, uh, you know, hydraulic fracturing has been used in Antrim County in the Antrim formation, which is a very shallow oil and gas formation, and they're all vertical wells. But it's been used in the Antrim area since about the 1950s. There are, there are 12,000 wells in Michigan that have been hydraulically fractured. Now those antrum wells are more vertical, so they don't use nearly the water that the uh, horizontal wells do. But that's just because they have a lot more vertical wells scattered all over. Uh, there's a, uh, a consulting uh, hydrogeologist that uh, goes around speaking in a lot of informational meetings. I can't think of his name. But he was asked in uh, Monroe County when we did a meeting, you know, is he concerned about the amount of water being used in hydraulic fracturing? And he said it's a drop in the bucket. He's not concerned about the quantity of water because we have so much fresh water. And, you know, when you figure 10 wells, even at 10 million gallons a well, in the big picture, that's not much. There, oh. there, last summer, though, um, or in, yeah, last summer, there were reports in Kalkaska that a lot of the wells were, their water was turning to like milk because mm -hmm. there wasn't enough. And our representative Janetsky called the representative in Kalkaska, I believe it's Kalkaska, and he said that yes, it was true. Well now, we'd have to know more about that because there are wells in Michigan and the DEQ says this when they do their presentations that naturally have methane in them. But well, this is more the water level was it's going like so low oh, okay. that what water was left was just 
Okay, now become like a that very well could be. I mean, you know, as you all know, I have all fashions now without controversy. So, but just one thing. I mean, there's a lot of supposed tos, mm -hmm. um, a lot of rules and regulations. But that, but I mean, I heard on the radio that 90 percent of the wells and such are not. There's not enough people to to check them out. Whatever. So there's a lot of supposed tos, mm -hmm. but we still have to do most of the checking to make sure things. Are done the way it's supposed to be, right? Like, like the flow back waters to go in tanks, but mm -hmm. yet it was spread on roads up north. Um, yeah, that was one. There was one instance of that uh, that I I heard about a little bit. Uh, I don't know all the de details. The DEQ has talked about it, uh, but there again, it was a supposed to that didn't happen. The way I understand it, the contractor that was handling those fluids was supposed to take them to a disposal well and to save money, he put them on the road. Right. It's brine water. Now brine water is used all over Michigan to control dust if it's the right chemical makeup. I don't think that had the right chemical makeup. But yeah, I, I think nowadays we all have to be <clears throat> alert. And that's, and that's just with a few wells being done, we've had some incidents, so. Excuse me, can I ask your name when you speak, so? Oh, Mary, Mary Glass. How do you spell your last name? G-L-A-S-S. -S. Okay, and the person before in the back, I didn't get your, what was your name? Uh, my name is Rosa Polici. How do you spell the last name? W-O-J-C-I-K. W-O-J-A-C-K. C-I-K. C-I-K. You know, in, in the Tarrant County area, you know, there's there's a concern that uh, there's too much uh, methane, which is natural gas, you know, being released from those wells, you know, and there have been people complaining about that. Um, but yet, you know, it's, it's odd. I mean, anything that we humans do, somebody's going to get sick. You know, there are people up in Mason County near those wind turbines that just swear those turbines have made them sick. You know, there's people that swear only gas wells make them sick. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's a difficult world. It sure is. But yeah, I think you know, nowadays we all have to be alert. Uh, the DEQ does say they feel they have adequate uh, inspectors and they have more per wells than other states, but uh, it doesn't hurt to be vigilant. So just one more quick question then. I kind of heard that if wells are dug in this area, you kind of alluded to this, that they wouldn't be hydro I mean they wouldn't be horizontally hydraulically fracked, but they would use the uh, the acid method. If it's uh, if it's a calcium formation, which like the uh, the Trenton Black River, you know, Jackson County is really a hot area. And it's the Trenton Black River, which is a calcium formation that already has lots of natural fractures in it. So they don't need to use hydraulic fracturing, but to just improve the production a little bit, they use some acid. So it depends on the geology uh, of how they're going to develop the well. And they would still be required to do water testing? If not if it's not hydraulically water. fractured. If it's not hydraulically fractured, they aren't required to do the water testing. Those, and that's a really good question. Those uh, proposed regulations are only for hydraulic fracturing. But in that case, they're, they usually don't use, uh, ver well, I don't know, I shouldn't say that. I don't know how much acid they use, I'm not going to say that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you betcha. How many private uh, labs are around the area or, or Mr. Midwest? to do the testing besides the DEQ? Oh, there's a lot of private labs. Uh, I've got, the DEQ has a list of them, and I've got that list on our uh, webpage also. Okay. And your health department should also be able to help you find a... The uh, health department pointed us all out to the DEQ last time. And oh, they, they pointed They told us that they only tested four heavy metals. So it was quite a big problem. Well, that's not the way these regulations state. Yeah. You know, it was the hydrocarbons and, you know, they're testing for things that industry is going to be using yeah. before and then after to make sure none of those materials got into sure the yeah. Right. Okay. 
So what is your name? Royal Striker. And the question on the leases. Uh -huh. um, when they approach you, mm -hmm. you just go get your own lawyer to have them look at it, or is there? Well, we have a list of uh, we have a list of uh, oil and gas attorneys that have said they uh, help private landowners. Okay. And if you get approached and contact me, I can give you the names of some of those on that list that private landowners have told me they've used in your area. Okay. Uh, because actually, in, in this day and age, you don't have to have an attorney in town. I mean, it can be somebody in uh, Detroit. Right. But you want to make sure it's an oil and gas attorney, not the attorney that handled your divorce. <laughs> well, yeah, that's what I'm wondering. You know, if, they're, if they're trying to be high pressure and want you to sign right then and there, it's like, you know, I don't know why somebody wouldn't just say, let me talk to somebody else. Well, but, uh, I tell you. It's, Absolutely. It's amazing how many people don't, uh, you know, that when they're offered some money right there, uh, they've never been offered it before, and you know, I used to be this way. Wow, I'm lucky enough. They offered me a oil and gas lease. I mean, get rich. You know, and, but I talked to a lot of landowners that wish they would have paid more attention, and now they got a bad situation. There seems to be quite a few attorneys in that field right now. Pleasant area, Gas City. Mm -hmm. There's one. Uh, dang it, uh, let's see. Well, there's one in Montcalm County, uh, Trent Hilding. Uh, but if you get me uh, one, I can give you some names that I know people have used off that list. So I'm really glad the computer got going. Man, this would have been bad. Can't trust all those handouts. Oh. Anyway, yes, sir. I just want to make an observation that statistically, you've got a lot bigger chance of getting hit and killed in a car accident in the state of Michigan than what there have been as far as leaks or issues with, with any of the wells here. Well, so far, yeah. I mean, uh, Michigan has a very good record. Yeah. Uh, you know, Michigan, uh, you know, I think they've been a little bit ahead of the game. They had. Uh, a lot of the regulations in place that Pennsylvania didn't have, and Pennsylvania had to learn the hard way. I mean, there's breasts and everything. I mean, yeah. you drive a car, you walk across the street, you know, whatever. Yeah. But, uh, but she made a good point, and that's why I said, <coughs> even if you get what you feel is a good oil and gas lease, you still got to manage that. Yeah. You got to be watching them. You got to watch them and make sure they're following and doing everything they agreed to do. It's just the way the world is. Because even though that guy wasn't supposed to put it on the road, he did it anyway. And um, it was supposed to go on a tank of where it was supposed to, but yeah. his job was to get rid of it. Right, we yeah. can't control what that person does. Yeah. Hopefully he gets a fine or something. You know, 99% of our laws are for the 1% that don't fall. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's really crazy. And what type of uh, mineral formation is in Calcasia area again? Well, that's that Collingwood Shale, and that's about uh, 8,500 feet deep. Okay. And uh, you know, that's something brand new uh, that started about in 2000. And actually, there was a leasing frenzy in 2010 up in northern Michigan. They were offering bonuses as high as $3,500 an acre. Yeah. But that Collingwood Shale hasn't turned out as well as they were expecting, so it's really cooled off. Are, are we seeing some of that kind of nationally? You know, it's getting, it's proving to be kind of expensive to get this oil and people are kind of getting in for the long haul instead of, you know, make, try, getting in for a quick buck? Well, well, if I understand you correctly, yeah, I think so. Um, and what? even the guy that invented hydraulic fracturing says it needs to be regulated. It needs to be regulated very closely so the fly-by-nighters don't cost the industry as a whole a bad reputation. Yeah. But do you, do you think some of that weeding out is taking place because the economics haven't worked out quite as well as maybe some of the early adopters thought it might? Um, yeah, probably, yeah. Um, you know, has anybody heard of Chesapeake Energy? Yeah. 
And Chesapeake's one of the really uh, controversial players. And in northern Michigan, they're some of the ones that signed leases for these big bonuses and then uh, defaulted. And you, everywhere you use Chesapeake uh, works, frankly, they have, they have controversy. You sure they heard the name of Clinton. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really with Chesapeake. Sure. Yeah. They heard the name of Clinton and they didn't hear Chesapeake. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, he's... You're right. <laughs> he's independently controversial in this county. Oh, he is? He has, oh, he a, he he has a big Lakeshore development that's been in court for... Oh. Is it decades yet? Oh, it feels yeah. like it. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, he didn't have enough trouble. He had to go borrow some more. Yeah, I didn't hear about that. Oh, yeah. yeah are there any uh, final questions tonight? All right, well, I sure appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate being informed is really important. Because I think fear of unknown is kind of scary.